And we should be back. Yes, I saw it. Love this mobile platform, except that all the text goes over the video screen and makes it very difficult to see or read any text. Thank you. I do love the graphic. Uh, now let me just find... I'm going to pull up the stream on my phone so that I can read the chat, not over a white, te white text on a white background. There we are. Oh, I can read that. This is not an old eyes problem, I swear. Otherwise, yeah, otherwise I love it. I can add graphics, I can do plenty of cool stuff. But uh, reading white on the hatchet blade is difficult. Ghost Dakar. I'm going to come in in a second. How about now? Hi. Welcome to the shop. I am Dakar, and tonight we're going to talk about and make something. We're going to talk about bags. I love containers. I have a problem. I have a problem with bags, boxes, containers of just about any kind. I like organizing things, clearly. I like labeling things, I like putting them into boxes. And uh, I like making those containers as well. So we're going to make a, we're going to start. You don't have to finish it tonight. I probably won't finish mine tonight. It's a fair, it's a little bit of sewing. It's not a lot of sewing, but it's all by hand. A haversack, which is this tangled up bag right here. Mm -hmm. More on that in a minute. Let's go over just a little bit of the different types of bags that somebody, either civilian, military, sailor, would be using historically in the 17th, 18th century. Um, and then some of the materials that we're going to use to create that. This is my go-to. Yeah, I've heard that there's a store somewhere in the Boston area called the Container Store. I was informed by my wife that I'm not allowed to enter that store. Or if I am, I have to go with no funds. I'd like to get there sometime. This is my favorite bag. This was made for me by my good friend, Dickie Austin, Lieutenant Austin. This is a snap sack. Uh, and this is what you would actually put a lot of your stuff that modern reenactors put into their haversack would go in here. This is sort of your personal kit bag. This is where you're going to throw your keys, you, you, whatever you have, um, maybe some extra clothes. It's like a day pack. All right, if you're going hiking, you got a little backpack, that's going to be this. This one is made of oil cloth, uh, which is a cotton canvas that has been coated with beeswax um, and linseed oil and made to be relatively waterproof. Snaps, sna no, Snapsack. This, which we delightfully call have a snack. Your haversack is for your food. We'll get to why in a minute. Uh, <laughs> yes, I do have a shop. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a tour. We'll probably move around a little bit, although I didn't put pants on, so we'll do a limited tour. I have pants on, they're just not appropriate. Um, this is my uh, basement workshop where I fiddle with, with making things. Um, so the snap sack is sort of your utility pack. This one is lined with a nice linen on the inside. It's relatively waterproof, leather strap. This goes across your body in the back. Just like that. You can also make these with a foam insulation that happens to fit a growler of beer. So I'm told. Um, this one's cool. It is seized. This is a sailor technique for closing things off tightly. It's seized at the bottom and the leather strap runs all the way through. So it helps to support whatever's inside. But you don't want to put food in here. The food you're going to be carrying is things like dried meats, cheese, stuff that has oils, moisture to it. You don't want that in here with your extra shirt, right? Okay. The other one that you're going to have specifically as a sailor. Hello, welcome. Welcome to the shop. This is what I carry... Most of the tools, a lot of the tools that we're going to use tonight. This is my ditty bag. A little round bottom, 
This one's seen some good years of service. Um, this is essentially like a any trade craftsman is going to have their tool bag, right? You go out in the morning, you throw your stuff in it, and it's got everything you need to go to the job site. This is the sailor's version of that, the ditty bag. In here, I have things like my rigging knife if it's not on my belt. My always working on boats, tie your stuff to you or you will lose it. My rigging knife, my marlin spike for tying, untying knots and in more modern sailing, shackles, the things that hold ropes and cables and such. So I've got a rigging knife in there. Don't worry, we'll get to sewing. Uh, I have, for sewing projects, some beeswax. We will use that tonight if you're using a natural thread. I have a sailor's palm, which if you have one, you can use it tonight. If you don't, well, sorry. This goes, this is a leather device that fits on my palm, and this is used for driving heavy sail-making, canvas-working needles through fabric. So the needle is supported on a brass base, and I can use this like a very, very heavy thimble to push this needle through multiple layers of canvas or leather. You can still buy these. Go into what, West Marine, any marine supply store, or the, uh, the Amazon jungle probably has them um, in a more modern version. Really useful for heavy-duty sewing, and will be in every single ditty bag. What else do I have in there? I have a little wooden fid. Um, this is the softer um, counterpart to my marlin spike, which is made of steel. This is made of wood, but just for working knots, working ropes, um, tying and untying splices and knots and things. I also get really big fids if you need one. That's a fid. Um, and then I also have in my ditty bag a housewife. They're portable. You just stick your wife in your bag. It's great. Get that out of the frame. A housewife is what a soldier or sailor is going to carry um, to do all of their fabric, mending, sewing, repairing, and making something new if you need to. It's a little portable sewing kit. Let me catch up on chat here. Super useful tool. The sailor's palm. Yeah, they are very, very useful for sewing anything. Uh, do I have any small picks or tools that I can secret away in my beard? Um, no, that sounds like a way to fall on something sharp to me. Uh, <laughs> but I can try. Maybe next winter I'll grow it out enough that I can do that. <laughs> my housewife contains some heavier duty stuff from working on canvas. Um, this is a seam rubber. It's a piece of mahogany. Any hardwood will do you fine. If you happen to have some mahogany around, go for it. Uh, and this is used when you want to put a crease. I'll, I'll use this in our haversack tonight. This is used when you want to put a crease into fabric. It's like an iron, but hand-powered. I have various pokey things. Awls and punches for putting holes in material and leather. I have um, some pins. I have needles. I have another fid, because hey, why not? I have a little hone for keeping um, scissors sharp, and I've misplaced my proper shears, so pardon me if I use a pair of modern uh, German sewing shears tonight, but a little pair of shears, and then all of my various pieces of thread. And that's what I want to talk about for just a minute before we get started, is uh, different types of material and the materials we can use to join those together. I talked about the oiled cloth, oiled canvas on my snapsack. Snapsacks can also be made of leather, but not good at all for storing food. You want something that's going to breathe, and you want something that's, I dare say, a little bit disposable if it's going to have um, organic material in it of questionable quality. This is the Army and Navy, after all. So the haversack is going to be made quite possibly of linen. This is linen fiber made from the flax plant. Very, very common in the 17th and 18th century. Probably the most common fabric. It's really awesome for clothing. It's very expensive to get good linen uh, these days, but this would have been your, your dime a dozen common fabric. It's a bit lighter and softer than cotton, so it's going to wear out a little bit quicker. 
but it breathes. And this is going to allow air to get through to your food and any nastiness to get out. What we're going to work with tonight, or what I'm going to work with, is cotton canvas. Uh, this would have been more common if you were in the southern colonies of North America where they were growing cotton, but uh, a little bit more expensive in the rest of the world. This could also be made of hemp. You can make a really nice hemp canvas. Again, more difficult to get a hold of today, therefore a little bit more expensive. Um, we're going to work with some basic heavy cotton canvas. And we're going to put all that stuff together. So we have various different options. In my ditty bag is a container, a little bag of what we call small stuff in the uh, naval trades. And this is all bits and bobs of line. Smaller than about half an inch is generally considered small stuff. Basic go-to is going to be something like this is probably a little bit smaller than quarter inch. Um, this is the real deal right here. This is hemp. Um, this is a modern manufactured hemp um, line. And I want to show you something cool about it. Well, I think it's cool anyway. I'm a rope nerd. The hemp that we can find these days at any kind of a reasonable price, and it's still about $5 or more a foot, is, look, look at, okay, so look at this. This is, this is a modern hemp replacement called Hempex. It's made of plastic. But it's really good. It gets a little dusty and powdery over the time, over years of use, but it's really good stuff, and it's a good cheap replacement, relatively cheap. It's about a, two bucks a, year, a foot um, replacement for real hemp, but Notice, okay, so I'm a North American. I am right-handed. Everyone in the 18th century is right-handed. If you're not, you're the devil in you and we'll beat it out of you. I'm kidding, of course. But that was their mindset. This rope is right-hand laid. If I pull apart, these are the strands. There's three strands in this piece of line. And it is twisted to the right. Okay? Twist it on something called a rope walk, which can be miles long. Big buildings or outdoor structures used for putting this under incredible tension um, to hold it in place. And this is turned to the right. This stuff, coming out of, I believe, the Netherlands, a Scandinavian country, is laid to the left. Now that's all well and good if you're doing macrame or something. But if you're a sailor and you actually need to use this line to make splices and such, you have to learn to do all of your activities backwards, all of your rope work backwards uh, because of the, the left lay. And it makes life fairly difficult. Uh, but it's still nice to have some of this on hand because it is incredibly historically accurate um, to be using real hemp. Sails would be made of hemp. Canvas would be made of hemp. Line would be made of hemp. There would be acres and acres and acres of hemp in every boat. Um, and just a huge cash crop and a very important commodity. Bring it back. End of tirade. Okay. We have Hempex. We got plastic, recycled plastic bottle line today. Um, H-E-M-P-X, if you want to look it up. It's good stuff to have on my hand. Um, I also have some, this is like hippie hemp. Um, you go into your local head shop, you can buy this for doing macrame and necklaces and stuff. Uh, it's really weak. It's not... Um, an actual braided line. It's just a single, this is essentially like one strand of this stuff. Um, so don't use this on anything that's going to support your life, um, but it's good for basic little fixing up and working. And from this, you would make a product called Todd Marlin. He's a good guy, Todd. Um, tarred Marlin. Marlin referring to this, the hemp line, and tar, of course, means that it's been coated with tar. So this is a waterproof material used everywhere on boats and rigging. Um, this, again, you can get different qualities. This is the good stuff, made of real hemp and tar, Stockholm tar. And then a lot of times these days, um, we use this, which is a nylon, um, which has also been coated in real tar, but it's a synthetic fiber. This is really good, um, high strength, and a lot of these things that you're creating on a boat uh, using this are um, serving, and seizings and things that if they break, you die. So as somebody who climbs in rigging, sometimes it's nice to use the synthetic stuff. It also lasts a heck of a lot longer. Uh, it'll take, a, it'll last for a couple of seasons in the sun, whereas the, the real tarred marlin is gonna go bad a little bit quicker on you. 
And there are when all the listings aren't expired. Oh, an Etsy shop. Oh, can we buy cool stuff there? Cool. Bring back beating the left-handedness out of people? No. I'm all for training everybody to be ambidextrous. Uh, I also have some leather rawhide lacing in here. Good, useful stuff to have around. We won't need that tonight for any heavy leather work. This is some cheaper Todd Marlin for cheaper usages. More hemp, hemp, hemp X. Um, this is a synthetic sinew. And if you're doing any leather projects, um, this is good stuff to buy. Now, modern, it's made out of some type of nylon probably, but again, it's coated with a wax um, to give it a bit more strength, a bit more longevity. And um, this is great for sewing leather. My sound is off. Well, I'm watching chat as much as I can. I have done nothing here, so... Okay, good. If everybody else can keep hearing, then I'm going to keep going because I've done nothing on this end. Um, nothing on this end has changed, so I'll keep going. Okay, it was you. Good. Well, I prefer that, actually. <laughs> Okay, um, what I'm going to use tonight, I think I might stitch with this stuff. This is a um, this is a linen thread, be really uh, really popular again in the 18th century. This one happens to be dyed black, so if you want to do a contrasting color, that's kind of cool. Um, it will need to be waxed though. This is not waxed. Um... <laughs> Doesn't want to listen to me. <laughs> I think what I'll use is this pre-waxed stuff. Uh, this is just a cotton thread, uh, fairly heavy, like an upholstery weight, that's been coated in wax. That gives it more strength, uh, makes it easier to sew through heavier materials like leather and canvas, and it also sort of uh, seals up that hole that you're making a little bit with the wax. And you can buy pre-waxed, or you can use something that's not pre-waxed, and just as you're sewing, run your thread over a piece of beeswax. A um, couple of times, and it'll then be waxed. Okay, I think we should get on to a project now that everybody can hear me. <laughs> That's okay. As long as everybody can hear me now, we're all good. Okay, what are we going to need tonight? If you're on the Discord, you can see the materials list right there. If not, I'm going to show you what we need. Um, Whoa, look at those cool stripes from the LED lights on the canvas. That's neat. We need a piece of canvas. Let me bring it back up to me. There we go. Make sure I didn't miss anything in chat. Do, do, do. No sound. No, we got it. Okay, cool. I'm caught up. I need somebody to read the chat to me. I need a, a shop assistant. You're going to need a piece of fabric. A piece of fabric about... Yay big. There are measurements in the Discord. Um, this is 31.5 inches long. Doesn't matter, something close to that. Whatever, whatever width you want your bag to be, uh, it should be that. And whatever length you want your bag to be, it should be double that. Or whatever height you want your, your bag to be. We are going to use this one piece to make the entire bag. We're just going to fold it up like that, and we're going to have our flap. comes down like that. Very simple. Let me show you what we're making. We're going to make something that looks like this. Um, this is your pretty standard linen haversack. This one happens to have three buttons on it. 
Um, the pattern, let me not just put it right over my face. The pattern that I've uh, put up and have cut out for tonight is a one button. I kind of like the one button. When this is hanging on your side, if you don't have the, uh, the two side buttons, you can sneak your hand in there, put stuff in, take stuff out. I kind of like the one button style. Um, and the haversack is going to carry your food. It's going to carry your daily rations, and it's going to be worn like this. Um, it's going to be worn on the left side, down on the very underneath of all of your other kit. One strap across your shoulder, which can be canvas, could be leather, could be finger woven fabric, whatever you want. Um, but you can see this, guys. Let's see if we can. Not zooming is not supported. Okay, fine. Uh, but you see right underneath his tomahawk and um, bayonet frog on his left hand side, you can see the haversack in there. There are a variety of different styles. This is a French style with some ties on it because they have to be different and fancy. Uh, and the haversack eventually morphed into um, different types of knapsacks and backpacks that we have today. Um, but originally it was mainly your food supply container. Eventually morphs into, uh, again, food supply in World War One, World War Two, more modern kits. We're going to make something pretty simple like this. One button, fabric strap, square bag. Uh, what's easy about this bag is that there's no gusset or bottom on it, unlike a ditty bag or something where you've got to do a little bit of math and make a circle and a tube and a cylinder. This is just a flat seam on the bottom, so it's just an envelope, right? Just a fabric envelope like that. Strap stitches onto the back, flap goes down over the front, buttons in place. Um, you, we're going to do a single button style, and you can use a button, you can use a toggle. In fact, Buttons. Let's look at some different closing options. Yeah, that fox is cool. He's not actually functional on yours as a closure, but um, he looks cool. Buttons. Buttons are wicked important before, like, zippers and Velcro and stuff, right? Um, I haven't figured out a project for these yet. These are uh, made of copper. They're a disc button, stamp disc button. These are called a dandy button because, of course, if you wear them, you look nice and dandy. Uh, I haven't figured out what those are going to go on yet. I think my capote may be um, big Canadian-style overcoat. But uh, for haversack, you can use anything on the larger size, pewter buttons. Uh, there's, a, there's an appropriate one, right? Yeah, yeah. Not sure how historical that is, but it's cool. Um, something about this size. What is that? About an inch? Yeah, give or take. Thumb size. Um, could be pewter or tombac, which is a, a common pewter alloy. Hey, that, that's a good size. Three quarters of an inch, something like that. Domed, flat, doesn't make any difference. Brass, if you want to be a fancy sailor type. Um, bone or even wood are all fine for button closures. And even simpler, and actually I think a little bit easier to, uh, to, to use in the field sometimes is um, cat, which you have on your belly box, which is a toggle closure, where um, you take something like this toggle, which is half finished. Let me get that haversack out of the way. Um, this is just made from a piece of, uh, of bone. I would put a little bit of a notch carved filed into the center of it and a thong around that, a piece of leather or uh, thread, and then this would just go through a buttonhole like a button. They stay closed really well. <coughs> really well. Um, they're fairly easy to open and close with one hand when you're not looking at it. But anything like that will work. Get to that later. Oh, look, it's not all buttons in here. How cool is that? That's a glass bead handmade by my friend uh, Sarah. Really cool. Um, you should check out her glasswork. I'll put a link up in the Discord a little bit later. She does um, historic reproductions of glass beads all the way back to Norse stuff and like Bronze Age stuff. It's really cool. Down with the Tyrant King. 
such and such. Sorry, George, I didn't mean it. Okay. Uh, oh, needles. We're going to need a needle. I have needles. Um, what you're going to want tonight is some type of a relatively hefty um, hand sewing needle. If you have it and you're going through heavy canvas, you can use a leather needle. Try to get a good focus on that. See the end of that? It's triangular shaped like a bayonet. If you want to get really fancy, you can take those to a stone and sharpen them. And um, this helps to create a, a, a hole through which your heavier thread or twine or whatever you're sewing with can pass through, unlike just your straight up round pointed needle, which is designed not to put a hole in the fabric, but to force the, the fibers apart and go through, um, which is fine for most sewing. Ooh, I mangled the, uh, the eye on that one, didn't I? Um, fine for most sewing, but not so good if you've got a really hefty project. So if you have something like a, if you happen to have a leather making or sail making needle kicking around, go ahead and get it out. If not, use whatever you have. I'm gonna use that one because it's new and sharp. Uh, needle case, you gotta have a needle case if you don't like sticking your hand on a needle every time you put it in your bag. A little piece of bamboo, great for that. All right, let's get to working. So the first thing you'll want to do, if you have not already, is hatches when you rip your garn. Oh, yes. Oh, hang on to canvas. Uh, I think some night if I feel, feel like doing a little bit of geometry, we can make a, uh, a ditty bag. That's a good project. You can never have too much canvas around. Um, if you have not cut out your canvas into something resembling this, now would be a good time to do that. And we'll walk through what we're going to do to this thing before we do it, and then we'll do it. Um, I'm going to bring this one up to this first fold. Also on the Discord is a little pattern that I drew to help show you what we're going to do with these different stitches. More bags, never enough bags. Yeah, smaller one. You can make. You can. You can never have enough containers for things. Um, so we're going to fold this in half, which means a we don't need to sew that seam because it's already a seam. Uh, that's also going to take the most wear on this bag because it's the bottom. Things are in it. It's getting rubbed on stuff. Uh, so it's nice to have that as a natural seam that we don't have to sew. And then the rest of this is just your flap that's going to fold over the top. So we'll do some work on this uh, raw edge here, but otherwise. All we need to do is now flip your brain and imagine this is inside out, because it is. At the end, this is going to be the inside of our bag. Um, we're going to stitch along these two seams right here. How tall should the top flap be? That is completely up to you. Um, what is that? Eight inches, give or take. Um, it really doesn't make any difference. Looking at the originals of Haversacks, they vary widely. Uh, obviously, if it was a military contract, they'd be a little bit more uniform, but they look like everything under the sun, from fancy uh, embroidery all over them to three buttons, four buttons, one button, no button, really however you want it. Um, but I like something about like that. You just want it to be enough of a, of a flap over the top to keep, uh, keep stuff in and keep stuff out. So our main sewing is going to be two stitches all the way along those two sides to turn this into a, an envelope. Um, and I will show uh, just a basic running stitch, which will work fine for this. Um, this is a... Er, nope, that's later. Don't look at that. Nope, that's the same one. Did I not get a running stitch? Maybe I don't have a running stitch because it's so simple. Here we go. Um, running stitch is just that one on the top. If you think of how do I sew something, think of it as this in the simplest possible way you can. That's a running stitch. It's just up through the bottom, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. That's it. And just run all the way down your seam. Uh, cool little trick. If you want, if you want to make sure that your stitches are all exactly the same size. Get rid of that. Take an indelible marker and I'm going to show it better. And a ruler. 
Decide what you want your stitch length to be. I'm going to go rogue and do it in metric. On your off hand, so your left hand, if you're proper, your right hand if you're left-handed, and make a mark at a certain distance of where how you want your stitches to be along your thumb. All right? You get it tattooed if you want to get real serious about this stuff. Um, and then when you're stitching, you're going to be holding your piece of work, right? I don't know if I put that in exactly the right spot on my thumb. And you can use this as a guide, up, down, up, down, a little measuring ruler on your thumb. Or you can just eyeball it. That's cool, too. All right. So... And you can pin this if you really want to, so that it doesn't move around on you. I'm not gonna. I'm just gonna load up my thread and my needle. Um, let's use, yeah, let's use this slightly smaller one. Holding needles in your mouth, that's safe. Um, get some of my... Get up here. There, over there. Get some of my waxed thread. I like to work with about a full stretched out two arms width. I don't know, what's that, six feet-ish? Should be plenty to do this side. And that's actually gonna become three feet because, set that off, we're gonna double this. Uh, everything that I sew that's gonna be used in the field and get any heavy use, I double. So that means we take our thread, uh, when it's waxed, it can get a little, little kinky like that, but that's okay. We like them that way. All right, and we pull that all the way like that. So we've we've doubled this over and come all the way down to the end and just even out your two tails. So now every stitch we take has double thickness of thread and will give it a little bit more strength. I'm a pinner. Um, yeah, you can pin it if you want. I'm not going to bother on this. There's a lot of slop to this. And then the two tails on the end, I'm going to make some knots. Um, and because this canvas has a relatively open weave, um, I'm going to do a couple of overhand knots. And this is going to be our stopper. So when we pull our first stitch through, that knot is going to go, and it's going to come up on our canvas and um, keep all of our work from unraveling because... Nobody wants to unravel. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I love doubling thread is an awesome thing. And if you wanted to get super fancy with this, you could do a back stitch or a lock hand locking stitch, um, so that that so you don't have that little gap on. Because if you're doing a running stitch, you're gonna have a little gap on a on the top side or a gap on the bottom side, whichever it happens to be. Um, there are different hand sewing stitches that you can you go backwards, but I'm not gonna worry about that today. In fact. With a haversack, a little bit more breeze is a good thing. It's fine. This is supposed to be a light and airy, like uh, like a produce bag. Uh, where is I'm going to use my seam rubber. You can use any. Um, you can use a marker. You can use a pencil. It doesn't matter. I'm just going to flatten the seam down a little bit. Put a little crease in there. Especially since I'm not pinning it, so that that is set. There's the bottom of my bag. And I'm just going to start to stitch. I think what I'm going to do tonight, see how long we want to chat. Uh, I'll do one side, and I'll show you the next step. And you can uh, finish this up whenever you have the time. See how that needle cuts a couple of those fibers as it goes through? Dunk. There. So our first stitch comes through um, and is caught by that knot. I know we have some master seamstresses and experienced sewers on the stream tonight. Uh, so please don't feel like I'm talking down to anybody. I'm going to make this as if this is your first time touching a needle and thread and fabric. I think that's a good way to start. Love the, the seam rubber. I'll make you one. They're super easy. Um, so I'm also not going to go with a super tight stitch. Look at an original 18th century shirt sometime. I'm serious. You want to feel really bad about your sewing skills? Look at either a properly made reproduction by somebody who's a lifelong tailor or an original. They were taking often more hand stitches, I'd say a tighter stitch 
than the actual fiber of the fabric or matched it. So every time there's a fiber of the fabric, they're going in and putting a stitch in. The seams were stronger than the fabric themselves. Incredible work. I'm not doing that tonight. Uh, and that would not be done on something as rugged as a military haversack. Um, I'm going to go, actually something about like what I put on my thumb. Um, what is that? Six an inch, give or take. So in that one, I came from the back of the haversack to the front. So I'm going to pick my spot, not too close to the edge. Um, this, is a, uh, this is a relatively loose canvas. So what I don't want is to get too close to the edge that it can pull through. But I could actually go pretty, pretty close on this. Well, that might be a, uh, a salve edge. There's a raw edge. Yeah, so you can see it starts to pull apart. If I make my stitch too close to the edge, that thread could pull out of the fabric. So I'm going to go in, I don't know, 16th of an inch, maybe a little, maybe an eighth. Push that through. And you're going to do that for the next half hour or so. I'm going to get rid of my, get rid of some of my little tail here so it doesn't get caught up in what I'm doing. Do, 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 do. Not I know. I don't recommend you try to make this as nice as a shirt. And you're just going to do that. And again, I have about, I have about a, three feet of thread on here. That is plenty to do this. Uh, and just do what's comfy for you. I'm trying to keep this under the camera so it's a little awkward. If I had it in my lap, I could kind of move the fabric, move the piece up and down a little bit easier. Um, or you can just flip the whole thing over if you really want to see closely where you're going in. When you do have doubled thread and it's fairly heavy like this stuff, um, make sure you don't leave anything proud. Uh, sometimes the two strands get a little bit off alignment with each other and you can have one that sticks up. You want to make sure that you're sort of tensioning that down, but not so much that you start to buckle the work, right? We don't want it buckled. But we also don't want these threads standing proud of the fabric. And we just run our stitch down. Like. Loose running stitch for most of because I'm going to have to stitch. Yeah. Uh, hey, it's, it's, it is historically accurate to have loose, sloppy sewing because if you, hey, if you got to make something in the field, it's not being done by a lifetime tailor. But the good stuff, even, even your moderately priced good stuff, this hand stitching is unbelievable. Um, I am friends with a master 18th century tailor. His last name is Taylor. I'm not kidding. Bill um, will spend, I think he told me it's about 100 hours for a men's work shirt. Uh, all hand stitched in incredible detail. For which he charges only about three to, well, it's probably about $400 these days, which if you do the per hour out, it's a very fair price. If you're having trouble getting your needle through uh, the canvas, you can use a thimble, um, which you probably have kicking around. Here's a, a wooden thimble, which can help you push that through there. Bigger, heavier needles, be really careful. Uh, this doesn't have the this doesn't have any divots in it um, like a modern metal thimble or like a sailor's palm. And if this slips off, that will go through your hand. Ask me how I know. Uh, if you're having trouble going through, if you've got a block of wood or a table you don't care about as much, you can press down on that. You can also often I'll fold um, my canvas over and press down on the canvas to help save the table a little bit. And give it a good firm pull at the end. If you're really still having trouble, you can get a pair of pliers and use that to pull the needle through. Try to either grab the body of the needle down here. Focus. Focus. Grab either the body of the needle or the eye of the needle side on. You don't want to crush the eye of the needle and break it. Then you'll have to find another needle. Who wants to do that? Try to keep these uh, stitches as much in a straight line as you possibly can. 
because then you have a straight seam when you're done. I'm probably making this a little bit more of an open stitch than I would if I was sitting by a fire working on this, but you don't want to spend the next four hours here with me in the shop. Your haversack is going to carry your daily food ration, whether you're a soldier. Uh, sailors would not be carrying a haversack around with them on a boat. Just going to get in the way. Dangly things tend to get you killed, um, get caught up in rigging and such. But you may very well bring one on board and stick it in your, in your sea chest or whatever private area you have. Um, on board ship, food wouldn't be given out quite the same way as it is in the army. Um, it would be a mess, a group of, uh, of sailors that would get together and be issued their ration. It would be a bigger group than what you'd have in an army unit, um, 20, 30 guys sometimes, usually a whole watch. And they'd have a big communal pot, toss everything in there, boil it, because it's the only way to cook things in the proper English fashion. In fact, most navies and armies of the time required that your rations be boiled. <coughs> well, yes. And it is, uh, yes. Having a good ample sea chest is important. Um, what was I talking about? It was required that your rations be boiled. A couple of reasons. Um, sanitation. Food is safer when boiled. Water won't kill you as quickly when it's boiled. And they didn't understand germ theory necessarily, but they understood that if you boiled water, you didn't spend the next three days in the necessary and then die. Um, that's the restroom. So uh, rations were to be... See how I'm getting that, that stitch... I got a little sloppy. Somebody distracted me. Um, I can, if I pull along my line of stitches out like this, I can take out some of that slop. And if it's because only one thread is proud, I can split my two threads and pull on them individually, and that'll help tighten everything up. The other reason to have rations be boiled is because then you make broth, and people generally like broth, and they drink it, and that helps to hydrate. Um, when you can't drink straight-up water, because, again, it'll kill you, uh, dehydration is a problem. Keeping people properly hydrated is a problem. Getting enough beer for troops and for anybody is a problem. So the more water you can get into somebody in a day, the better. Only the fancy officers would have roast meats and such. It also uses more fuel. Boiling is really probably one of the more efficient ways of cooking up a lot of food for a lot of people. Um, uses less fuel. <laughs> yes, it is a necessary on board ship. Of course, it would be the head. But, uh, yeah, when you arrive and, and set up a camp, you uh, create... you. you Send somebody out to dig a trench for the necessary. So look at that. What was that, 10 minutes to do a seam? Easy. We'll do the other side, too. Um, if I had pinned that, like Kat suggested, I wouldn't have this uh, funky bit on the end here. But that's going to be on the inside, so I'm not going to worry about it. Now, I'm getting towards the end of this seam. You may or may not be at the end of your first seam, but I'll show you how to finish one, so when you get there, you can. I'm going to come up through on my last stitch, try to time it. I made that one a little bit longer just so that it came out even, so that I'm coming up on my last stitch at the end of the seam. Let me get you. Hold on. There we go. Get you a little closer. On my last seam, I'm coming up. I'm going to go under my last stitch. 
You can also go through the fabric itself, through the fibers. I'm going to go through to make a loop, and then I'm going to run my needle through that loop. Drop it. Don't forget to drop it. Pull it tight. And I'm going to do that another couple of times. You can also make it even um, more secure by doing a surgeon's hitch, which is through and through and through. Same thing, but just a couple of times. And pull all of that down, make a big old mess out of it until it pulls tight. And that should be more than sufficient of a knot uh, to hold that. And then we snip it. Like that. And I might have enough thread left on there to even do the other side. So there is our first finished seam. We got a little, I got a little buckled there because I pulled tight, but I can just massage that out. Get all the kinks out of it. Clean up my workspace and go on to the other side. Yeah, you can see, look, I didn't pin it and I got off by a sixteenth of an inch. Terrible. There will be a flogging if I'm lucky. Okay, up through. Oh, I got to put a new knot in the end. I'm not sure I have enough thread here. I could get stuck and have to piece it in, but hey, that's a good learning experience. Could put a knot in there. Another knot in there. You only got a quarter way up. That's okay. I'm going to keep doing the same thing on the other side. And if you want to finish this up another evening, you certainly can do that too. Clink. There. Good stopper knot in the end of that. That is not enough thread, but we're going to go with it so I can show you how to piece a piece in when you screw it up. That was my plan from the beginning. Okay, just like that. I snip off that tail. Oh, look, I'm getting some, some threads for those. The other bag, which is starting to be developed in the 18th century, is a knapsack. And um, it's, it's a bit of a natural evolution from a haversack, although they were often carried together, both of them, one for food and one for your clothing. And uh, knapsacks are really cool. Oh, that, would be a, that would be a fun stream project. That might be a multi-part project. Uh, knapsack's a little bit more involved. But it's really, it's not too dissimilar to haversack a uh, canvas more of a canvas covering for your stuff than a nap, than a proper modern backpack um, but you put your extra clothes and such in your knapsack and then it actually goes on your back with pack, proper pack straps uh, that was something that comes along towards the end of the 18th century by Napoleonic times, there were proper knapsack backpacks with leather straps and such. Um, but, of course, people had been making their own versions of it for ages before that. The haversack, this style, actually goes back to ancient times. We have um, Byzantine and Egyptian. Uh, I don't know if there are actually any physical examples, but there are definitely depictions of bags very much like this. So your basic soldier would be carrying a haversack for their food supplies, a knapsack or some type of blanket roll precursor to a knapsack on their back for their extra clothing, uh, personal accoutrement, and a blanket or two to be sort of incorporated into your bedroll because those are things you only need when you're in camp, so in the evening or the morning. Your haversack with your food you want access to in case you want to take a little break for a nooning lunch. It's called nooning. So you want you don't want that all wrapped up and rolled up in your bedroll. You want easier access to that. If you are a rifleman or a hunter, you would also have a shooting bag or shooting pouch, usually made of leather, and that's going to contain your gun tools. Uh, I think I showed mine. I don't know if I showed my shooting bag in the last stream. Um, your ball, your gun tools, patches, cleaning implements, things like that. Cartridge box. It's a piece of specifically military kit. With another box or bag. And possibly a snapsack like mine just for incidentals. 
if you're on the more civilian side of things and you're going to the market, you may very, very well carry a market wallet. That would be another good one or two hour project, selling project. Uh, a market wallet is sort of a big, long fabric tube um, opening on each end, or opening in the middle, rather, closed on each end. And sort of goes over your shoulder, across your body. There were a couple different styles. I gotta fix this a little bit of loose stitch. There we go. For carrying things that you might buy at the market, haversack will work good for that too. Uh, and of course, baskets were super crucial for carrying stuff pack baskets, food baskets. Similar reason to the haversack. Uh, well, one, they're cheap and easy to make. And two, they're airy. So if you're putting foodstuffs in a basket, it's going to get airflow, and it's going to help to uh, to keep it fresh longer. The other thing that would be carried in a in a soldier's haversack is their mess kit. Seems obvious, right? You might as well put your eating tools with your food stuff. Um, I have my officer's mess kit today, a little bit fancier, uh, a pewter mug. Catch up on chat. Super easy. Yeah. Oh, well, pockets are. I wish I had pockets, but then I'd have to wear a dress and my legs get cold. Um, well, there are pocket slits in your petticoats. So there are, are slices in your skirt, essentially, um, that you can get your hands into and get to your pockets. But yeah, they're tied. On, it's the first, first thing you put on after your uh, chemise, your shift, or your pockets. Then they're properly protected from pickpockets. Uh, mess kit. So a little bit better off. An officer might have uh, pewter. A really well officer would have silver. I don't. Um, a mug. Basic soldier or sailor would have a tin cup. Um, it's going to rust out a little bit quicker. But nicely, it's light. This stuff is wicked heavy. Uh, but of course, I'm an officer, so I don't plan on really running around too much. I have a bowl or some type of, uh, could be just a wooden plate, wooden trencher to eat off of, but something um, to put your food into. You can also makes a good shaving basin. Yeah, so that incredibly often. Uh, and then my food consumption tools, um, a pewter spoon. This is an 18th century rat tail spoon, so-called because of the, the little tail in the mold there. Um, spoons are cool. I, I like spoons, um, and the style changes. I'm forgetting the exact change of king to king or king to queen that happened, but somebody changed the style of spoons that were popular. In the six, up until about the 16th century, it was a round bowled spoon. Um, and then somebody decided in court, this was a cooler pattern. And so everyone went to the rat tail spoon, and those round bowl spoons are super hard to find in the historic record. Uh, and archaeologically, they just don't exist. There's tons of these. You find pieces and parts of these all over. You find spoons in collections. But what happened is pewter is expensive. It was either pewter or silver, so it got melted down. Uh, there were tinkers or, or traders that would come around to your house, and they would have a spoon mold. They would take your silver or your pewter, melt it down, and cast recast it into the modern uh, style of the day. And so it's uh, it's hard to um, it's hard to find the uh, the the older style spoons today. Um, I do have a reproduction of one. I didn't bring it down. I'll show it sometime. Um, but you got to have a spoon, right? Again, wood for the uh, the lower classes. Pewter with a lot of lead in it, don't scrape your teeth. Uh, I think this one's actually, yeah, this one's lead pewter. Don't scrape your teeth uh, for the middling classes, and then silver, of course, for your, uh, your upper crust. A fork and a table knife. Um, nice bone handle. This is an original. This one is, uh, is probably from the 17, yeah, 1790s, poss possibly 19th century, but it is original, two tine. The French were starting to use three tine forks in the 18th century, um, but uh, the English are generally still using two. And you'll notice it's it's wicked sharp, right? This is not for bringing food to your mouth. That would be considered extremely rude, uncouth, and you would probably stab through your tongue. Um, the table knife is what you actually eat off of. So you're holding the food, 
uh, you're cutting it probably with your belt knife with something sharper because these are relative, a little bit of an edge there, but a rounded blunt end. Some of them even have this big sort of um, bill-shaped uh, extension on the back. So you're, you're cutting your food and you're lifting it with the knife to your mouth to eat off of. Uh, the food is the, the fork is just for securing the food so that it can be uh, turned into small pieces. Culinary lesson for the night. Okay, cool. And and I like eating that way. I, I find it natural and, uh, and kind of interesting and not something that a lot of other reenactors really uh, portray terribly often, although we're usually just eating with our hands because we're like that. All right. Back to my stitch. See, I gave everybody a chance to catch up on your sewing. Yeah, this this one, uh, I like this one because it's made from flat stock rather than round stock, so it's not quite as pointy. Uh, but, uh, yeah, some of them get absolutely dangerous. There's a uh, possibly apocryphal story of a reenactor somewhere down in uh, in the southern parts of the North American continent. I'm going to run out of thread just about at the end. Uh, who was partaking in a battle reenactment. Went up to the medics, called for a medic, and said, I've been bit by a snake. Oh, my gosh. Get him. Okay, get him out of here. Get it. Wait, wait. You're bit by a snake. Yeah, right there. I fell down, I got bit by a snake. Okay. What else were you carrying in your bag that you landed on? Oh, my mess kit. He had stabbed himself with his fork in the leg. Two little perfect little pinpricks. That looked like a rattler bite. I'm sure he was quite relieved. <gasps> Am I going to make it? I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. Maybe not. Yeah, um, but the, the knives are different. You don't want... This does evolve from essentially your tableware being your belt knife, and that was that was it. That's what people ate with, their fingers and their belt knife, and they would often eat off the knife. And then they got a little bit smarter and said, let's blunt this knife, and that's where the table knife comes from. <gasps> oh, jeez, I'm so close. Uh, I'm going to try it. Nope. Okay. Just... Uh, all right, what I'm going to try to do here is get this as tight as I can. So I'm going to come back through one more stitch. Now, nah. yeah, we'll do that. I'm going to just, eh. all right, well, I'm going to snip this off. What am I going to do here? I'm going to fix this crime when I go to put my strap on the back. So for now, I'm just going to tie this. But if you had enough thread... You do the same thing that we did on the other side. No, that's not going to work either. I'm just going to leave that like that. I could, uh, I'll fix it up later. Two seams. One seam on either side. All done. Okay, that was the easy part. Now... We're going to invert our bag. Yeah, we can do that now. We might have to turn it a couple times. We turn this inside, right side out. You might need a little something to shove down in the corner. If you get your finger in there. There we go. Turn this the right way around. get a, a pencil or something down in those corners and really pop them out. And that is what our finished seam looks like. That's why we did it inside out, so that we get this nice um, flat seam on the outside. And that'll, that'll flatten out even more as you put stuff in it and use it. Um, but we don't see the ragged edge of the fabric. That's all sealed and is not going to unravel. It's sealed by our stitches. And we get this nice little seam that looks like any other seam on a bag or garment. Okay. Or inside out. We are at the one hour mark. Yay! That's pretty good work for an hour, plus my yammering on for a while. Right. 
so that's where we are now. We have our envelope created, three sides, one we got away with, two that we stitched, and now we need to deal with this flap. There are a number of ways to deal with this flap. The fancier way, okay, here, well, here's the, here's the problem that we're trying to solve. The fabric is not sealed on the edge in any way. And if we just leave this, it will turn into a nest of fibers over time. Being all traditional uh, organic materials, we can't just take a big lighter and go along the edge to keep it from unraveling like you could do with, uh, with something synthetic. Now you put the safety pin. <laughs> no, we're going to finish. You're going to finish our sack. Uh, we have to do something to this edge so that it does not uh, fray. Good comic book, bad for your haversack. So there are a couple ways to deal with this. I could put a hem on it, like you'd have on the bottom of a pair of pants, or an end of any kind of fabric, by folding this over and doing the same running stitch that I did all the way down there. I'd have to make a little slit here, so that I could fold this over without getting a little uh, little canvas nipple on the end. But if I just put a little cut where my anywhere there's a sharp angle, I can fold it over like wrapping a, a holiday gift. And I can put a, se a hem along the whole thing. That would be a cool way to do it. Often haversacks were lined with a thinner fabric, like linen or something, so that if it became damaged, uh, if you whatever, you, you had a moldy bit of cheese in there, you could take the lining out and you could replace it. Uh, and if you're doing a lining with this, well, then you'd have something to fold this over. Your lining would come in here and you'd stitch the whole thing shut and that would take care of your edge. But the easiest way, and the way I think I'm going to do this one, is with a, uh, a blanket stitch. Throw a pillow. Everybody has unfinished projects. Uh... Although we're going to have everybody post pictures of what they finished tonight on Discord, right? So uh, a little bit of pressure. We're just going to do a basic blanket stitch along the edge here. That looks like this. Um, that makes it look complicated. It's not. All we're going to do is take our needle and thread. And it's also called a, a, a whip stitch. I think it would be the same thing. And just just stitch around this edge so that it holds the whole thing together. If you have a wool blanket, a fleece blankets use this a lot. Uh, it's just stitched in a rolling fashion around this whole edge. This will probably take us longer than uh, when the sides did. And uh, if you want to get real fancy, you can make it nice and tight. If you want to be uh, a little, little quicker, you can open that stitching up. And this would be a cool place to use like a, a contrasting thread color, like this black. And I'm going to do that, because why not? Also, I uh, should have thought of that earlier. Black on white would be a lot easier for everybody to, to follow along with, wouldn't it? Okay. Now I know. And that's half the battle. I'm pretty sure somebody could could double check me on um, on Google, but I think that a whip stitch is the same thing as a blanket stitch. All right, so I'm going to use some of this stuff. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm this is nice and thick. I'm not going to double this. A couple of reasons. Uh, it's a thicker thread, but also this stitch is not holding any weight. It's just here to to keep that from unraveling. So you really don't need to to double it unless you're using thin like. If you were using a thin modern thread like this, um, then you would, would still probably want to double it. But if you're using a heavier stuff, this is not structural. All right. That. Whip just goes around the edge. It's a running stitch, but instead of going through the same way. Okay. Right. Yeah. Which I usually I usually screw up the proper blanket stitch and uh, end up with just kind of going around like a barrel. But let's let's see if I can do this proper locking fashion. Let's see if I can thread the needle first. Hey, look at that! My my tablet is a magnifier. 
Uh, that needle is going to be too small for this stuff. That's my problem. There's your problem. Okay. Yeah, let's pull that uh, that image back up or another one. There's our blanket stitch. So you, it does it locks through itself. I'm putting that up to cover the fact that my eyes won't let me thread the needle at the moment. There we go. Okay. Tink. I'm just going to start on the edge. Actually, i got to go all the way down. I um, made my flap a little bit taller than what I had cut it for. That's okay, but I am going to want to uh, seal up that edge as well. Wow. Oh, I got a, I got a little off kilter on that side, didn't I? Boy. If only I had a way to fix that. <laughs> what problem? Okay. And I'll start it with a knot on the end. Buttonhole thread. Yeah, nice. It is a bit difficult these days to find good heavy thread, especially of a natural fiber. People just don't often do that kind of sewing anymore. Upholstery thread, buttonhole thread is awesome. If you ever go into an antique store or garage sale and you see like a basket of old sewing stuff, take the old thread because it's good. I mean, pay for it, but take it. Okay. I'm going to bring this through so that my knot is going to end up on the inside of the bag when it's closed. Just so I don't see it. Okay. That's what we're doing. We've gone up. We're going to go down. I've still not seen that film. So now that's started. So when I do this, I want to, rather than just going up and down like we did on the last one, I'm going to go around the outside edge and then down through my loop. Let's see if I can make this look right. Yeah. Around the outside, down through my loop, and it sort of it locks itself. And you'll be able to see that stitching on the outside, which is why this is going to be kind of cool. So I'm never going up, right? If I've decided to work from this side, I'm going to always come down, which was probably not the easiest way to do that. Down and through my big loop of thread. And it's going to create a lock. And it's going to start to make this pattern on the outside. Which is, this is going to look kind of cool with the black. I understand Mercy is making a purple haversack. I'm jealous. It's my favorite color. I think, ooh, we got purple with um, orange thread for this. That would be cool. Okay. Yeah, you're starting to get a look of, uh, of what we're looking for. That one I went too close to the edge, but you know what? I'm going to let it go. I'm going to move on. So it's creating a chain, right, as we go. This is the most complicated stitch on this whole thing. You can master this, you've got it. Of 
Look at that. Nice. I screwed up one in the middle there, but it's all right. You can kind of pull it tight as you go. This would be easier if I had flipped, started working in the other direction. Like a challenge. I should probably be uh, waxing this thread, but again, this is a non-structural stitch, so I'm not super worried about it. I might rub some uh, some warm wax over the whole line of stitches when I'm done, just to give it a little bit of uh, extra protection. Oh, you're doing purple on purple. That's okay. That'll be cool. Um, contrasting thread is a thing, historically. Whether it's so much for looks or just, this is the thread color I have and the fabric color I have. Uh, well, you used every bit of thread and every bit of fabric because it's expensive. And you're either making it yourself or you're buying it with your hard-earned shilling so uh, you're gonna use every little scrap of it and any scraps of fabric that you have left you would sell to the ragman or rag woman who would come around buying rags and use them for all kinds of industrial applications um, paper making most often Rag paper is made from literally rags. Uh, it's a fabric paper. Nothing went to waste. Look at that. That's what we're doing. Doesn't that look cool? <laughs> I'm happy with that. Okay. Happy little blanket stitch. Shipwreck? Shipwreck what? Oh, that's code that did something for others that I don't see. Okay, probably. Yeah, little patches. I need to patch. Speaking of, where is it? I got some patchwork to do. I will patch that from the inside. The shoulders on a work shirt are always the first thing to give out. They're in the sun often, um, and it's a high stress area. You patch things until there's nothing to it but patches. Then you think about making a new piece. Yeah, do the Discord. We got cool stuff happening there right now. There are ideas going up for makeup contests. Well, maybe it's not a contest. Collaboration. I put two things up there today. If you haven't seen them yet. I won't be doing makeup. I'll be spectating. I broke my thread. Luckily, at the very end, where it was rubbing on the needle. Be a, oh, yeah. There's some sharpness inside. Hi, buddy. I have a cat visitor. Always have cat visitors when you're sewing. Oh, come get in the way. Come up, sis. Come on. Come on. I'll give you a ball of string to play with. Yes. It is Mr. Jinx. Of the shaky tail jinxes. When he gets excited, he shakes his tail. Come here. Treats! Oh, goodness. Well, uh, how about a piece of, uh, of a ball of string? If he would come over. But he's in the basement, so he's got to go explore first to make sure everything still smells like his face. And then he'll be back, I'm sure. I will get him treats. Okay, yep. Uh, I don't... Don't have a ball of yarn. I got a ball of hemp. 
What cat doesn't like hemp? Oh, now they're both coming to look. Let's see what's happening. There's a conference on the stairs about what I'm doing. Should we kill and eat him now or later? Later? Okay, cool. I'll get them on, I'll try to get them on camera at some point here. There we go. There's, apparently, there is a cat conference happening on the basement stairs right now. I do believe they're deciding if they're going to kill and eat me now, or fatten me up a bit more. They are lurking. Yes, they are. This stitch takes a long time. That's okay. Oh, I got that one too close to the edge. That's okay. It's my haversack. It'll be okay if I want it to be okay. I should have pulled those. There's a. I should have pulled those a little bit tighter. Um, right there is a little sloppiness, but it'll still do its job. Look at me. I'm a little sloppy, and I still do my job. Come here, buddy. Come on camera. Xander is now lurking at me. Xander Harris, a.k.a. Captain Fuzzy Pants, a.k.a. Cuddle Wumpkins, a.k.a. Get down from there. You're going to hurt yourself. Oh, look. I'm halfway done. Yay! It's kind of cool how quickly one of these can go together. I can totally see somebody losing their haversack, destroying their haversack, and sitting down at a campfire on a sh shift off on a ship and just saying, All right, I need a new haversack. Gotta make myself one. And they'd have their housewife, their Wife in absentia to do their work for them. Meaning they do it themselves. I'm going to run out of thread again, aren't I? Yeah, I do. I, I think it looks cool. I like the blanket stitch for this. If I really wanted to get super fancy, we'd put a lining in this thing, but yeah. I do like this black uh, contrasting thread. Come here, buddy. Come You're not going to jump up because there's stuff up there and you don't know how much stuff. Okay. All right. Uh huh. Then what happened? Come here, son. Yep, running away. I will fulfill the treats as soon as I am finished if they don't want to come over. They have uh, kitty treats in the cabinet. They also have cat weed in the cabinet. Hi. Can you come up? No, you have the skin of a dead animal on your lap. I don't want to come up. You're a cat. You're supposed to walk all over my sewing project, knock everything off the table. It's in the contract. Didn't you read it? can keep yammering on about my cat, but if anybody has questions in the chat, please throw them at me. I will either answer it 
accurately or make something up that sounds good. History questions. Favorite cake. Whatever. I know, look at that. I'm close, but I am going to run out of thread. Um, now is the time to fix this. If I go too long, I can't fix it. So I'm going to admit defeat and fix it now. I'm going to take a bit more thread. And the reason, okay, so you would think you take your thread and you tie it together. Problem being, you're never going to get that knot through the fabric. Oh, now, it, now it's Battle Royale on the basement floor. They're tussling. Um, so I'm actually going to tie it as close as I can back here. To the, to the stitch itself. Uh, and I've got a little leeway because that thread has to come over a little bit before it goes back down. So as long as I get my knot in that little space right there, it won't make any difference whatsoever. I sewed up both sides. Is it time to flip it right side out? Yeah, if you've done it both sides, go ahead and flip it inside uh, right side out. We may invert it again to attach the strap, but that's fine. We can do that. We have thumbs. I still have two, magically enough. So I'm just going to do a square knot. So square knot, pick a side. I'm going to pick this right side. I'm going to bring it around in a simple hitch. I'm going to bring that hitch as close down there as I can. Stay with my right side thread, which is now on my left side. Go over the top and down through. And I have made a square knot, a.k.a. a reefing knot. And that, now see how I did that? That's going to sit right there. It's going to pull that nice and tight-ish. This stuff's a little slick, so I'm going to put a, what I would call a, a, a safety hitch on that. Just another third hitch. It doesn't slide itself out. Important knots. Yeah, we should do a whole uh, stream on knots. Okay, make sure I don't cut the stuff I just put on, which is exactly what I almost did. Trim off my little ears. Blink, blink. Now, if I'd been thinking ahead, I would have done that so the knot was on the inside of the bag and didn't show. But you know what? We're going to call it part of the process and artistic. Rethread my needle, and now I can carry on sewing like nothing ever happened. Knots, put them on my calendar. Okay, I will. There's really, let's see, if I were to do that, I would teach five knots. And you could get through life very happily with five knots. And one of them not even really being an not even being a really a knot. Um, the square knot or the reef knot that I just showed you, which is easy to screw up and turn into a granny knot, and nobody wants that. Square knot or reefing knot. Called a reefing knot because it's what you use in the reefs of a sail, which are the line. If you ever look at a, a sailboat, even a modern sailboat, you see a bunch of dangly little lines uh, at different intervals up through the sail, usually along the seams. Those are reef points. Um, I'm not sure exactly where that name comes from, but we say that it's uh, because you do that when you don't want to hit the reef. Uh, it probably has something to do with uh, coming from uh, breaking, right? A reef breaks the, the waves up, um, and a reef breaks your sail up. It allows you to reduce your sail area and um, reduce the amount of power that you're getting out of the wind. And you want to do that very rapidly sometimes. So knowing a reefing knot well is a good thing. And if you uh, if you screw it up and tie a granny knot, you're going to hear about it. In a gentle way. The bowlin is a way of making a secure loop uh, on the end of a line, which will come undone just as easily as you made it, which is great because often a bowlin is like on a mooring line or an anchor line and it's under a lot of tension. And if you used any other type of loop making knot, it would be permanent after that. So a bowlin can always be broken and you can make it 
as successfully in thread as you can with five inch cable. It's a great knot to know. Yeah, granny knots spin, they don't lay flat, uh, and they can slip. Um, square knots are great for joining two pieces of similar line from their bitter ends. So the, the cut end, the end of the rope is the bitter end. So if you want to extend something, it's great. Or just join two pieces together. Uh, the bowlins for your loop. You then have to know how to make off uh, a couple of different... Um, bits or points. So tying a rope to a thing on a boat, whether that be a cleat, them's be cleats. Uh, you see these on docks, you see them on ship rails and things. They can be wood, they can be iron, they can be bronze. And there's a specific way to tie uh, the bitter end of a line or even the middle part of a line around a cleat. That's something you should be able to do with your eyes closed in a hurricane. Um, and then there's different, there's a, a hitch that you use to tie off to a bit, which is just an upright post uh, open at the top on a ship or a dock where you have access to the top of it, right? You have to be, you kind of, there's a looping hitch that goes over the top. Uh, and then probably a clove hitch, which is for tying a, uh, a line to like a post. What else do we do? Oh, yeah, I didn't put the needle through my hand, though. I'm okay. <laughs> A couple of knots are good to have in your back pocket. You really, you need a handful, then you get into some fancy stuff. Um, oh, a figure eight knot I would put on there. That's a good stopper knot. You put it in the end of a line if it's going to run through something, like a hole in something. Um, when we're making, we should, we could, uh, well, it's, uh, it's too late now. We've done all of our stitches. It would be a good one to use for in sewing so that something doesn't pull through. Okay, I didn't know that about the, the chat not being on replay. I will, I will read. I can read. Um, yeah, I dropped about 10 pounds of uh, metal cleats on top of my needle. I'm glad I didn't put it through my hand, though. So figure eight knot, stopper knot. Um, I don't know, maybe a couple others, maybe. All right, I'm coming to the end of this here. That's good. Yes, Jinxie. Yeah. Uh huh. I saw you were fighting on the floor. You were tussling. Okay. Aw, oh, thank you. Yes, I just did that intentionally. You like the sound of my voice. I appreciate that. I like talking. Uh, okay, so I'm getting to the end. I'm just gonna go. I'm gonna go up through. I'm gonna leave myself a loop. And I'm going to give it a couple of hitches through that loop. Just kind of make a knot somehow, either through the thread, through the canvas. Just finish that off. One more. There we go. Look, plenty of thread left. You'd think I did that from the beginning. Okay. Don't cut these things too short. Leave a little bit of tail so it doesn't pull back through. Um, if, the, if your stitching is going to fail anywhere, it's going to be either at your knot or at your knot at the end. So give that a little extra lev. All right. Look at that. Oh, I, ooh. Ooh, ignore that one. <clears throat> Pay attention to that little bit. I can always, if I've got a spot like that that's too loose, I can always go in, re-stitch it on either side and cut that out, but... Oh, that's where I that's where I extended. That's why. Okay, I could add a couple of extra stitches to that to hold it down. But overall, that's kind of all you're looking for. It's uh, it's pretty simple, just so that that edge does not unfurl itself. And then we have. Oh yeah, we got one more to do. 
and I go along here. Again, you could have hemmed this. You could fold. Um, this is the opening. You could fold that over and do a running stitch, which I might actually do because I've got a little slop on my corner. I'm going to put a running stitch as a hem all the way along this raw edge at my opening. I'm going to do that with the black thread so that it looks cool. I'm not going to bother doubling it because, again, this is not a structural piece. This is just, that's enough. Sure, that's enough. Uh, this is just a an, another unraveling stitch or unraveling seam. Anti-unraveling seam. That's a double negative. Raveling. It's a raveling seam. All right. I may actually, I am going to pin this because it's, there's not enough for it to hold itself down. So I should have another little bamboo container full of pins. Let's talk about pins. Pins are cool. Uh, pins were a way for women to make a little bit of extra money historically. Let's start pinning that down there. Uh, because you can make them at home and they'd be made of brass and you'd buy wire. And then, oh, that's hard to pin through. Um, you would put a head on it, either by uh, twisting or by um, heating it up a little bit or heating up uh, another rod of bronze and putting a little dollop of metal on the end. And then you would sharpen it on a stone. And historically, earlier on, you know, think Tudor, Renaissance time period, Everything was held together with pins, specifically women's clothing. There could be hundreds and hundreds of pins holding together a garment just for daily wear. And uh, yes, buddy, I hear you. Come here. Nope, we're running away again. Um, so pins were bought by the thousands, made by the millions, and easily lost. So you find them, if you go... Any archaeological dig, you're going to find pins. They are all over at the river banks and the shorelines of Europe. Less so over here, because that was starting to go out of fashion by the time Westerners were coming over here to uh, say hi. And by that I mean pillage and genocide. But hey, it worked out. Okay, now I have that pinned, secured, in place, and I can go along and hopefully my pins are far enough down that I can put my stitch right along the edge there. Do, 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 need my needle and my thread. Is it, yeah, easily found uh, if you have carpeting and you walk around barefoot where you're sewing. Um, I need a knot in the end of that. A magnet is really good for that. Go to the hardware store and get a magnet for picking up nails at a construction site or in a shop. And you can grab them all. Wouldn't have helped uh, people historically with their bronze pins, but... Okay, so I've made my knot. I've brought that up through so that this knot acts as a stopper. Forgot to show you a figure eight knot. It's okay. This stuff would be really small to try to watch knot working. And, and I'm just going to run uh, a very loose running stitch down here to keep it from unraveling. Good. We're at about, an, we're about 20, 25 minutes left. Magnetic pin cushion. Yeah. Um... Hardware store magnet, or uh, like at a toy store, or like a science store, they often have magnets that are in a wand for playing around and doing science experiments. Those are good. I've got a couple here in the shop. Oopsie. Look for 
sometimes. I'm making this stitch nice and wide and loose because, again, it's not holding any weight. It's not keeping my lunch in. It's just creating this little hem. Is it? The thread pulling is picking up? <laughs> oh, just wait till I start shooting cannons on stream. I want some good audio. <laughs> I might have given myself. Oh no! I got a. Oh, I got a knot. See, I pull it out. Oh, I can pull it out. Okay. Oof. I have a little too much thread, and this stuff likes to uh, bind up, and it's catching on my pins. And ay, ay, ay. There we go. Nothing worse than getting a knot in the thread in the middle of your work, because then you can't pull a knot through. Yeah, we'll do some black powder firing this uh, summer. I can't go out and do it for real very much these days. Not a lot of events happening, so I uh, can do it here. Yeah, Doc and I have not had a chance to blow things up together yet. We need to rectify that. Last time we were hanging out together was at a wedding, and there were no explosions requested. Silly people. Who doesn't want explosions at their wedding? I don't know. It was a pretty killer wedding, though. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Cannons make everything better, unless you're on the wrong side of it. shift the chat around so I can see it without turning my head. That would have been good to do an hour and a half ago. Okay. Uh-oh. Drop something. It's probably full of pins. What's going to be full of pins in a second? My hand? Oh, it could have been the Sharpie. Nope, it was an all. It all fell on the floor. Somebody <laughs> stop me. Okay. Oh, shift over, keep it in frame. Look at all the extra thread I have. 
Overconfident, overcompensating maybe? Okay. You are in my way. What I do to things that are in my way is I cut them. I can use this for my buttonhole, yes. I hate buttonholes. I don't want to do it. I'm also not the best at it, and I kind of do a little unorthodox version, but I'll do it. All right. I'm just going to kind of pull up the inside here, tie this off. Oop, oop. All I'm doing, I haven't made this clear, I'm just using that last stitch going through it and then through my loop. And that does the same thing as making a hitch in a square, or in a, uh, it's, a, it's a half hitch. A full hitch is two of those, which then will actually hold. And I'm going to put three, because I don't want it to come apart. There we go. And just pull it tight. Pick up the mess of pins before I dump them on the floor. Eh, take the pins out of my seam. How are we doing time-wise? Oh, we're doing great! I can't actually see the time, but I know we've been... I've been talking for an hour and 41 minutes. I'm not counting the first part where I screwed up the name of the stream. That's why your Westgate doesn't have buttonholes. Yeah... Uh, it's kind of a pain, but thank you for that because you made me think I should show my Westgate buttonholes as an example before I try to do this. Essentially, you're going to cut a hole in your fabric, and so you have to do the same thing that we did here, uh, and a blanket stitch will work. Um, I'll do that sometimes, but usually I'm just kind of going around in a barrel stitch or like that running stitch that's going around the outside. Yeah, just, just one on the haversack makes it easy. Uh, chink, chink. Pull out my pins, which have served their purpose well, but are no longer needed. And there! That's all the major sewing on this thing. It's going to go like that. We do need a way to carry it, though. Um, let me just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause for a second. Um, yeah, close whip stitching on a buttonhole so that it's pretty much touching, at least on the inside um, radius of the buttonhole. It's, the thread is pretty much touching, and then it kind of fans out as you go out from there. But anything will really work as long as it keeps the fabric from unraveling and from the, the buttonhole itself from expanding, which you don't want. Um, I'm going to take just a brief second to see if anybody uh, wants to update me on where you are, see if you have questions, if you're back on the part of going, how much canvas do I need again? Um, try to catch you up to where we are. So if you have questions, if you want me to go back a step and re-explain something, let me know now while I get a drink. show off some of my pewter collection while I do. Ooh. I have a container, box, and bag problem. I also have a pewter problem. Uh, okay. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Fast and Furious. Um... So on both sides, turning it right side out, I have to go back and rewatch for the next step. Yeah, I would, um, you can go back for this part, but you're basically just going to blanket stitch all of the, uh, the raw edge on your flap. And... Yep. Oh, there's pictures in Discord already. Yay! I'm not going to try to look at another screen, but I will definitely look after. 
And and Kitty Cat was helping. Oh, good. Oh, here comes mine again. Are you finally going to come up? Okay. Come here, my boy. I'm going to pick you up. You know what's going to happen, okay? You should just relax and accept it. Oh, there we are. Ah, cat. There he is. Now he shall walk all over my project. <sighs> it, that's your butt. Yeah, it looks the same time, same as the last time you shoved it in my... That's your tail. Thanks. Love you, too. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no needles. <laughs> Best time for the cat to jump up here. Well, he, he jumped up with only with a bit of encouragement, so... He's wondering who I'm talking to. Okay. Let's talk about strappage. A couple of uh, ways you can carry this. You're going to want a strap. Where's my, where's my haversack? It's just a basic shoulder strap, um, which attaches to the back. I don't really like the way this one is done. I think they did this so that you could slide your belt through it if you wanted it not to flap and flop all around as you ran, which is not a bad idea. Uh, but I'm going to attach this one just um, onto the back with a stitch pattern. Where's my pencil? Oh, I wanted to show this off too. Book recommendation. That's probably upside down, isn't it? Um, if you are looking to recreate stuff from the time period of the American Revolution and before, from French and Indian War on up, let's say, um, this is a fantastic book to have. This is Collector's Illustrated Encyclopedia of the American Revolution. There's also one specifically for swords and blades. But this uh, was put together, let's say, back in the 70s, probably around the bicentennial, um, going through private collections and archaeological finds and cataloging a lot of the more mundane camp stuff, buttons, buckles, clothing, canteens, bottles, this is all stuff that is very well documented to the time period um, and is a great reference, although there's usually only one photograph of something. It'd be nice to have sort of multiple angles, um, but uh, great documentation for either picking up antiques, originals that you want to use, or reproducing things. Uh, and there is a section on bags which a lot of this soft textile stuff doesn't survive very well through the ages. So they've done some drawing recreations from uh, engravings and from paintings. But you can see um, haversack, and then as that evolves, becomes a knapsack, and how you can just use a bedroll um, with a tomplin to, uh, to carry your kit as well. So if you can find, you can probably get these used on Amazon. I'm sure it's not in print anymore, but um, great book to have. I'll, look, I'll try to find it on, uh, in the jungle and post a link. But that was sitting on top of my sketch pad, which is what I was really going for. The way we're going to attach this... There's our haversack back. Uh, our strap is going to come in here, like that. And what I'm going to do... Let me try that again. Oversized for illustrative purposes. Focus. Okay. I'm going to stitch. Focus. I'm going to stitch in a square around where the strap is going to be on the back. Like that. This is going to take, this is probably the most structural piece that we're going to be sewing. So I'm going to sew in a square. Oh, hi. Welcome. Yes, we are we are getting to the end stages of uh, of haversack, at least all the different parts. Um, I'm going to stitch that square, and then I'm going to stitch in an X, like that, in the middle of the square. And you can do this in one kind of thing. You can go do 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 boop, and then um, you got to make the sound effects too. So that's the pattern that I like uh, for attaching a strap because it it helps to distribute the weight really well, keep it from tearing out. Um, but we are running up on time, so I'll talk about the strap. I won't necessarily attach mine. I'll let you do that, and uh, if anybody has questions, just put them up in the Discord, and we can, we can follow up. A couple ways to make a strap. 
Uh, could be leather, although that's a bit pricey. Probably not going to be on a haversack. Most likely it's just going to be a fab bit of fabric. And this is just a scrap of the same canvas that I'm using. What I can do is fold this over. So what's this? Three inches wide, four inches wide. Could be a little wider. I'm going to fold that over. I can stitch up the whole thing. Stitch a hem here or even do a, a blanket stitch would keep it from unraveling. Go through both pieces and just blanket stitch all the way up you've made yourself a nice comfy fabric strap. You can also buy, and was available historically, um, cotton webbing. This is just straight up cotton that's been made on a loom. Um, could also have this finger woven, if you know somebody that has a finger weaving loom, or you do, and that would make a nice, you could make that nice and colorful, and they're really comfortable to wear. Uh, this I find much more comfortable to carry than something made out of fabric. The fabric tends to eventually kind of just turn into a twisted mess, um, whereas this can be untwisted very easily. It's a little bit more comfortable to wear. Don't have ready, yeah, the, the ready-made strapping material. Again, if I, you know, if I was stuck out in the field or on a ship and I needed a haversack, I might not have this stuff. I can just make it from whole cloth. From cloth, yeah. uh, but this stuff is is much much better if you have it. This is a uh, inch and a half ish. The wider it is, the more comfy it is. But this is a pretty common size right here, whatever that is. Porta crayon for scale. This is an 18th century pencil, by the way. Um, don't let anybody ever tell you that they didn't have pencils in the 18th century and everybody wrote with a quill. That's silly. You don't write with a quill and ink in the field. Um, this is a, uh, a French style of a, a porta crayon, and it would have a shaft of lead or graphite, just as your pencils do today, although they don't usually use lead anymore, um, in this really cool brass um, cylinder with little locking uh, rings that slide, and as they slide, it releases the, uh, the lead on the end. And it's a pencil, and these things last forever. Uh, when they're when they're full, and then you can uh, refill them when they're not. So, cool, huh? Oh yeah, you could. Oh, that's a good idea, um, Katie. To sew lines. Well, I'm assuming you mean something like this is our strap. Do something like this occasionally um, to keep it from twisting. Tell me if that's what you are thinking. Can sew lines? Oh, along the length, like this. I don't, I have never done that technique. Straight down the strap. Okay. And that'll keep it from twisting. You know, I'd have probably have seen that done, but I don't think, I've never sewn that. That's really cool. Okay, I'll have to try that sometime. That sounds like, boy, if you're, so if you're making, let's say, a yard and a half strap, that's a lot of stitching. Uh, I might try it on the machine. <laughs> that's a good idea. Cool. Okay. Can't cut a straight line. Oh, well, that's okay. What you, it doesn't have to, look at this. This is not, this isn't straight. But you can fix that when you if you when you fold it over. If you even want to take a straight edge, you could draw a line down for your stitch, and then it would be straight, square. Maybe hats. Yeah. Okay. Oh. So is that what um, what keeps the front what what keeps it upright and in its shape must be on a navy hat. Ah, cool. Okay. like that. So, you will attach your strap somewhere in this vicinity on the back. Um, don't put it right up here. You want to get, put it down a little bit. Um, if you put it right on the edge, you'll have a hard time when it's under load, when it's on your body, to open the flap. You want it down, down a little bit. Uh, if you want to get really fancy, I have seen these with straps that run all the way down um, the back of the haversack and sometimes even around the front. Don't know how old a, ver a version I've seen with that, but then the straps support what's in the bag. Um, so if you want to get really fancy with it, you can extend those as well. But generally, commonly, they're just going to be attached with a square on the back again with that. Who's the right side of it? With the X uh, and the square stitching like that. 
And then our button, a button, well, our button hole is going to go here as a vertical slice. And that means that our button will end up somewhere uh, underneath here. Best way to do this is to make the button hole uh, and then put your button on um, so that you're not trying to line up the button to the, yeah, anyway. Uh, that's what I think. Uh, people may do this differently. Um, so I'm going to select a button. And then we're going to start this. I know we're coming up on time. I'm going to... Ooh, that's cool. Look at that. Little bone button. Let's use that. Sweet little decorative carved bone button. Yeah, that's what I... That's, is that what I said? Is that the way I said it round? <laughs> do the buttonhole first and then place the button to match it. That's that's what I think. Yeah, because you can move a button really easily. You can't move a buttonhole very easily. <laughs> okay. Most people will tell you, <clears throat> they're probably right, that you should do your buttonhole sewing first and then cut it. That's the right way to do it. But I find on canvas uh, and leather, and with bigger buttons, like we're using, like I'm using here, that I have more luck cutting it and then just stitching it. I'm a sailor, okay? I know how to make a grommet. I'm not so good at making buttonholes, but I know how to make grommets. And that's essentially what I'm going to do with this buttonhole. If you know a better way, if you do it a better way, do it a better way. But um, I'm going to do it this way. We can go longer than nine? Okay. I'll go longer than nine. Stick around if you want. I have no, again, I know, I know we've gone a, an hour and 57, so it's probably is past nine. But So I've made my little mark. Mm -hmm, I don't want to make it too small for my button. So I'm just going to kind of fold my fabric over. Try to, if you fold this over and it's square, then your buttonhole will be straight. I'm just going to cut that. And every pop proper seamstress out there is probably going, what did you just do? Humanity. But again, I know how to stitch grommets. I'm not very good with buttonholes. I'm just going to put a knot in again. I can take all the time I want. I, can, I am allowed to wrap at nine. Oh. But I can go on as long as I want. Well, that's good. And if people want to stay with me, stay with me. Because honestly, there, there's my alarm telling me it's nine. Look at that. Let's listen to it for a second. And that's, you're going to get two notes, not even a full bar, because it's copyrighted music. Because honestly, if I turn the stream off, I'm just going to sit here and keep working on the haversack, so. Why not stick around with me? Boy, I have not done one of these in a long time. Well, I guess, no, I did a buttonhole on your belly box, technically, but that's leather work, so. I'm going to try. I don't know that I've ever tried this. I'm going to try doing this as a blanket stitch around with the lock and everything. So down, come out my little buttonhole. <laughs> it's important to come out your buttonhole. I don't know how this is gonna work. We're gonna try it. Uh, if you wanna do this, as a more proper fancy buttonhole, I'm sure that there are instructions available in your local public library. But I'm just going to do enough so that it doesn't uh, pull through. You made something like a haversack a long time ago. Ran the straps all the way around, sewed them down the back. Yep, yep, yep. Um, the tube on the top and the extra length comes around to attach to ring buckles. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, I have a... Um, uh, okay, uh, and honestly, I, I cut off a lot of the uh, what I considered superfluous straps, but I have a cool modern leather like uh, computer bag 
man purse that um, has that same, the straps go all the way down and underneath the bag to support the weight. Yeah, that's a good idea. So I'm just, basically I'm doing that same thing we did on the blanket stitch. I'm just going around the uh, buttonhole and I'm doing this pretty loose, mostly for time. And uh, let's call it efficiency, not laziness. but it will certainly serve its purpose. I'm reading that again. Uh, two loops to the top with an extra length on the ring buckles. Yeah, that sounds really cool. I'm all for extra hardware bling on anything, especially if it's brass or bronze. Slight shop tour. I may have a small problem again with buying brass, bronze, hardware, it's a thing. Yeah, oh, these are, these were a huge score a couple of years ago. Check out the size of those brass rings. Solid cast, they're not welded, there's no break in that, they're cast bronze rings. You got small ones too, but look at those. They're cool. I haven't figured out what to do with them yet. Maybe a nose ring. I don't know. Which side is it? This is starting to look like a buttonhole. Yeah. It's not for a fine garment, but this is not a fine garment. That's going to work. I don't have a problem at all. No, no. I'm just, uh, look. Can't exactly run down to the local hardware store in town and buy a four inch diameter cast seamless brass ring when I need one. Now, can I? If it's not here in the shop, I'm not going to have one. And then where would I be? Ringless. Lesser known cousin of Toothless. This is kind of working. Well, I missed locking that last one. That's okay. That's okay. Gotta remember to go through the loop. No tongue buckles. No center post. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, just ring buckles. Yep. Nice. Beat them down to an oblong shape. Permanently attached to the strap on the flap. To buckle the bottom strap comes up. Yep. Um, from the bottom, through both, over the top and back through the lower ring. Yeah, that is a, a super early buckle design. Um, Bronze Age tech there, love it. Uh, Roman buckles are often like that too, um, so that you have just the simpler shape, no moving parts, uh, using two rings to make a buckle. See that in a lot of horse tack still too. Usually the tongues on a buckle are made of iron, and uh, they can you know, tend to be fragile and break as opposed to the, the non-ferrous metal. So if you can get away without moving parts, do it. Cat's back. Keep going. What you do? Yeah. I'll come see what I'm doing. I still owe you both treats. Don't let me forget. Looked at nothing historic when you did it. Well, no, you used the exact same human brain and problem solving that they did. <laughs> you went, hmm. Oh, no! I have a knot in my thread. Oh, fiddlesticks. Well. Oh, I made a nice mess. See, I can't read and stitch at the same time. I'm going to pull up. 
I'm just going to finish this off right here. Oops, I cut that too short, didn't I? Call that a buttonhole for tonight. I will have to go back and mend that and put a few stitches. I can do that right now. Just put a few stitches in there and fix it. Capture that little bit that I screwed up. They will not let me forget the promise of treats. No, it's almost time for second dinners. They're on a hobbit schedule. Kind of got a little messy here, but I'm just going to capture those bits that are loose. I was like one stitch away from being done. And I got a big knot in my thread. I have a little trick. I have a loose end there that is going to pull through the fabric, so I'm going to capture it with that loop and pull that tight and give that a couple stitches over it to secure it. It's not perfect, but it's better than it was. So that little tail think, is now stuck down and hopefully won't go anywhere. Well, that's an ugly buttonhole. But it is serviceable, and honestly, this looks like a very accurate period piece made by, well, me, somebody who's not a tailor, somebody who has not grown up learning the important skills of sewing. Um, you know, I was not taught from childhood how to do sewing. So, you know, you see original stuff that looks that rough. It's serviceable. Marley's driving up a wall. When would that ever happen? Licking the power cords. That's because they can feel the electrons flowing. They love it. <laughs> Christmas vacation when they, yeah, poor cat. Chomped on the light cord. Okay, so we've got our buttonhole. Let's see if my button fits through it. Oh, yeah. So now I'll just stitch my button on wherever I decide that should land. Right there. This this is not exact. I mean, it doesn't have to be exact. There can be a little extra to your flap. Everybody likes a little extra flap sometimes. I'm going to double my thread again for putting the button on. And this is a two-hole button. Uh, Four-hole buttons, I'm going to say, were not used in, uh, in the 18th century. Oh, bother. That needle's too big for this buttonhole. Uh, Four-hole buttons tend to come along later. In the 18th century, you're looking at mostly uh, two-hole, although more commonly it would be a shank back button with the little loop, um, either part of the casting or brazed on the back to hold your thread. Um, if somebody can prove me wrong and show me documented whoop, uh, 18th century four-hole buttons, I would love you because there are a lot more antique four-hole buttons to be had out there if you want to use originals, which buttons are something I like to use uh, originals because they, they this is not as I'm drilling a bigger hole in it, um, but they're cheap. You can generally find some period buttons. Okay, I'm going to go back and read... Yes, you want to leave yourself a little extra space uh, with the flap so that you can actually put stuff in it. Uh, and also, if you haven't sewed on a lot of buttons, don't sew the button on tight if it's a flat style like this without the shank. Um, leave yourself enough uh, thread so it'll actually go through the buttonhole and not be too tight such that it breaks the thread very quickly. Oh, this is going to take a while, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, my little pin vise drill. I'd... 
I want to get all modern on you and turn the drill press on. That's just embarrassing. So. Yay! When the hole is too small, you get the drill out. This is just so I don't put a smaller needle on. I, I, I don't know, don't need to. Pin vices are awesome things to have. You can use a little drill. I, this one I carry in my uh, my ditty bag for just this reason, although it's not proper, period, correct. Um, but it's not far off. Uh, they'd be using a little bit and brace, just a little handheld drill. Um, but for putting very precise holes in little things, yeah, little small holes, things that, um, so a drill usually is fast, unless you have a metal drill or something, and it um, puts out a lot of vibration. So if I were to take this bone button to the drill press, I'd have to be really careful that I didn't just shatter it. So the hand, hand drilling works well. And now, look at that, needle fits right through there. I'm going to leave, make sure I leave enough space so that it can actually serve as a button. And I've doubled my thread, so I'm probably, I'll see if I can get through here twice, but by doubling it, and see I already have two, uh, two layers, two strands of thread, but we'll see if we can't go through there again. Um, the other reason to leave the button relatively loose is it gives it a little bit of slop uh, to ride on the thread. If it's too tight, it will cut right through the thread and you'll lose a button. And that's embarrassing. Nope, I don't have space to get the needle through there again. That's okay. I'm just going to tie this off on the back. This is where I decide how much I want to leave from my button. Not that much, but way much. Oh, come on. Tie a knot. I can tie a knot. I know I can. I've done it twice before in my life. There we go. The Canadian Army... Ooh, broke that. This thread is not the strongest stuff. I'm glad I didn't use it on the sides. Canadian Army makes parkas with buttons that you can boil in water and they turn into chicken broth. How cool is that? How they did that. Okay, look, it's a serviceable button. He says as he has not yet actually buttoned it. There we go. Look at that. Look at that. That'll take a little bit of mending work to fix that buttonhole up, but... It is serviceable. It closes. It holds my lunch in the haversack. Love it. Burning holes. Yeah, burning will work with bone for sure. It kind of melts and smells really gnarly when it happens. Thank you. Yes, I think it looks fairly good. Uh, where is everybody at with their project? And before we go, are there any questions? Want me to go over anything again that I did? Uh, you can always reach me in the Discord, of course, if there are questions later on. Last thing I would need to do here is attach that strap, but that'll happen another time when I get round to it. I may see if I have a piece of finger woven, woven cloth to make a strap for this one, because it's kind of fancy with the black stitching and everything. Lots of project. Paused for now. Okay, that's cool. There's, this is a good thing to just pick up and work on when you get a chance. Um, but that's it. It should come out looking relatively like a square. That was the common form factor. Start with a rectangle, end up with a square. We put our strap on the back of it. But that's pretty much uh, pretty much how you make a haversack. This video... Tell me if I'm wrong, but I believe this video will be available for review after. 
uh, here on Twitch and then eventually on the YouTubes. If you want to go back and make another one or see something you didn't see, something I went too quick in. You won't mess it up. Why, thank you, Captain. I think everybody did. I'm looking forward to seeing pictures, which I understand are already on the Discord. I've got to go over and check those out and see uh, see what's been happening as people have been following along. But, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, look at that. Decorative, contrasting stitching. We did good tonight. Um, so, put that away to have its strap put on sometime in the next 15 years, which is usually what happens when you put a project away and don't finish it the first time. That's okay. Good to have things to do. Um, if there are no further questions, I think we'll call it a night. Let me just make sure. If I set it up to... I Yeah, I don't know that I did that on my end, but um, we'll see. We'll find out. They're going to come back in style. <laughs> yeah. Um, they are good for just... If you wanted to just take your haversack and use it like a re reusable uh, grocery bag, it would work really well. Yep, I, I will go modern camping and just grab a haversack to put my food in because why not, right? It's easy. Uh, I don't know how I got to be awesome if I am. Um, I think my cat's awesomer. They're scrambling around upstairs. I think it's second dinner time for them. And I will give them their treats. Thank you for their treats. Pirate raid of the grocery store. Yep. <laughs> cool. Munch reenactment. Yep. Yep, hopefully there will be some reenacting coming up soon. All right, cool. Then I think we will end it there. Put your pictures up on the Discord. Questions as well, if you get halfway through the project and say, what did you do? Wait, what? was it? Was the strap supposed to go down the bottom or on the top? Put it on the Discord. I'll answer. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, we'll figure out soon what the next, uh, next shop talk, that's hard to say, topic is going to be. And as soon as it gets nicer outside, which is starting to, we'll get out and do some things around the fire. I know we're going to do some uh, some lead melting. We'll make some musket balls, um, do some fire starting with flint and steel, and probably burn some gunpowder. So join us then. Thanks. Bye.